Hi, I'm Trainer Lori, and I'm excited to share with you the story of my great-great-great-grandfather, Colonel Hans Christian Hegg, a Norwegian immigrant. Colonel Hegg has been honored with a statue in both Wisconsin and Norway, and a naval cargo ship during World War II. But to me, Colonel Hegg is family that my grandmother told me about. This four-generation picture on the steps of the Wisconsin Capitol building also shows her father, grandfather, Colonel Hegg's son, and great-grandmother, Colonel Hegg's widow, Gani. In 1964, the family reunion in California included some of Colonel Hegg's grandchildren, my grandmother again, and me. My pedigree to Norway really starts with his father, Evan Hansen, born in 1790, in Riga, but was called to arms in Lear in 1814 when Sweden invaded Norway. After the war, Evan stayed in Lear. He was a Lutheran lay leader with a spirit of service, or dunexts, as they say in Norway, and started working as an innkeeper for Ole Gulliksen. Eventually, Evan married Sari the daughter of Ole Gulliksen, his boss. Hans Christian, the first son, joined them just before Christmas. By then they had moved to the Hegsta farm. Then Ole, Andrea, and little Sophia joined the family and they decided to immigrate to America for the opportunity to own land. And they took the name of their farm, Heg, for their American last name. The Heggs were among the 90 passengers aboard the old ship, Amelia, on her second voyage to America with good Captain Thomas Anchison from Drammen. Amelia left Norway on June 12, 1840, after a stop in Göteborg, Sweden, to pick up a load of iron bars, she waited for the wind. It finally built with a vengeance. When they were mid-ocean, a storm hit, giving the old ship such a shaking that the upper berths gave way. The screams of the passengers added to the fury of the storm. Finally, 75 days after leaving, Amelia and her very tired passengers arrived safely in New York Harbor, where they had to move all their possessions and four little children off the ship. In the city, Captain Anchison helped them to get to the next leg of their journey, a huge help since they didn't speak English, onto a steamship headed up the Hudson River to Albany. Then they moved by a barge across the Erie Canal to Buffalo, the gateway to the Great Lakes. In Buffalo, they moved all their possessions and their four little children onto the last ship, to traverse the Great Lakes to Milwaukee. From Milwaukee, they pushed and pulled their possessions and four little children one final time, the last 30 miles to the new town of Muskego and only the fifth Norwegian settlement in America. After traveling nearly 4,000 miles, it's a good thing Norwegians keep in shape. Evan purchased a farm with a small cabin, which is now a museum. The large barn that he built became an inn to house new immigrants passing through. The barn also served as a Lutheran church where Ivan would preach and perform weddings and baptisms. Sadly, in 1842, they lost their mother, Siri, during a cholera epidemic. Some Norwegian newspapers wrote about the horrible conditions in America, prompting friends from Norway to write letters wanting the facts. The Muskego settlers sent a manifesto to Norway. The Morgenbladet in Christiania was the first newspaper to print it. In part, it said, America for centuries has been a safe refuge for exiles who conquered the difficulties of every pioneer community. We have no reason to regret the decision that brought us here. Seeing the power of mass media, Avon bought a printing press and published the first Norwegian language newspaper in America called Norlisa or Northern Lights. More than 500 Norwegian American newspapers followed them. At 12, Hans had thoroughly learned English and became a translator. 
At 18, he served as guide for the people heading west. His positive attitude and sunny disposition turned his customers into friends. When the lure of gold called from California, Hans and three friends answered. They found enough gold to cover their expenses, plus the profit of $1,000 for each. That's $30,000 each today. When news came that his father, Avon, had died, Hans hurried home to take on his family duties. The first thing he did was marry Gani, Jakob's daughter, Ainaun. Her family had come from Tin, just 90 miles from Lear. Gani was only seven when the schooner Alida crowded in 187 passengers. Typhoid fever ravaged the ship, and her mother, Anne, her Aunt Anne, and her sister, a twin, Suzanne, all died on the voyage. Her dad, Jakob, made it to Muskego, but died just a few years later. Before he died, he left each child the enormous gift of 40 acres of land. We don't know how the orphans survived, but the community and Avon Haig certainly came to their aid. The year after Gani and Hans married, my ancestor Edmund joined the family and Hilda the following year. They lost baby Annetta to scarlet fever. And finally, Elmer came along the year the Civil War started. As a married farmer and now mill owner and storekeeper with roots in the community, Hans started his journey of public service, elected to many local and county positions. He was chosen to be a delegate at the state convention, which led him to earning another first for Norwegians. Hans had become the first Norwegian American anywhere to be elected to a state office. Wisconsin Prison Commissioner. He was also the first warden in the United States to encourage education over punishment and open shops to teach the prisoners skills. When the Civil War broke out, Hans volunteered to lead the first all Scandinavian regiment. His Wisconsin 15th Volunteer Infantry called their companies St. Olaf's Rifles, Odin's Rifles, Norway Bear Hunters, Scandinavian Mountaineers, proud of their heritage and Colonel Hegg was called a gifted officer, leading the men through many effective battles. While they were successfully forcing the rebels eastward, he wrote a book's worth of letters to Gani. In one of them, he told her, you may become a widow, but you will never be the widow of a coward. In one of the worst battles of the war, the 15th was fully exposed to enemy fire during repeated attacks and counterattacks throughout the day. While actively rallying his brigade from one of these repulses in the late afternoon, Colonel Hagg took a bullet in the gut. The regiment's doctor, his brother-in-law, spent the night with him as he writhed in agony. In the morning, he died. After the war, of the 900 soldiers who started with Colonel Hagg, the 306 survivors of the 15th Volunteer Infantry erected the only monument to an individual soldier at Chickamauga, a cannonball pyramid to honor Colonel Hegg where he had fallen. The Norwegian Society of America commissioned the statue of Colonel Hegg to stand watch at the state capitol building. On the 4th of July, 2,000 people, many of whom had given dimes and dollars to pay for the statue, came to see the unveiling of their Norwegian American ideal. Nearly 100 years later, on a hot June night during the COVID quarantine, the statue was torn down. A leg was snapped off. The head was stolen. It felt like he had been killed all over again. Today, the good news is the statue has been restored, and a lot more people know who Colonel Hagg is and what he did for good, both in Wisconsin and around the world. I think you would be glad for this opportunity to educate the people. His statue has been reinstalled and a rededication ceremony is scheduled for Memorial Day weekend, 2022. Colonel Hegg's living descendants are spread throughout the United States. Through Edmund, there are 12 adults plus children. From Hilda, there's 10 adults plus children. But baby Elmer wins. His line has 28 adults plus children. Our last family reunion was in 1988. I can't wait to meet again in 2022 in Wisconsin.
to celebrate the life and legacy of our ancestor, Colonel Hans Christian Hag, immigrant, abolitionist, and trailblazer.